So um, I know I don't look like Dr. John Rodriguez, but he was, in fact, a, one of my mentors. He was an attending when I was a resident. So um, before he left to care for some people, he imparted me one last gift, which is this talk. Um, so hernia development and recurrence, is obesity overrated? These are his disclosures, which are not relevant to the talk. So certainly obesity is a pandemic of epic and global proportions, and we know that people are not getting skinnier. Um, with a significant number of adults that are overweight or obese in 2016, and that's going to increase to about 50% in the next couple of years. And so, you know, obesity certainly is a chronic disease. We often see that not only is there a lot of medical comorbidities associated with these people, but that it is something that is very, very challenging for people that even undergo bariatric surgery. So how do we approach hernias in these patients, and how do we optimize our patients that are obese for their care of their hernia? So the first thing is, is as people increase in weight, so does their risk of developing a ventral hernia. With people with a BMI greater than 30, twice as likely to have a ventral hernia than those that are underweight. Um, obesity and especially metabolic syndrome increase postoperative morbidity, and recurrence rates are higher um, in patients with obesity. And oftentimes, there is a set BMI that we want to achieve before people undergo a hernia repair. And so the question is, is as people are getting heavier, are we denying them appropriate care? Or what is the appropriate care for overweight patients? And certainly, the incidence of obesity is not only growing um, rapidly across the world, but also uh, rapidly in this area. Um, and so I think as we consider patients uh, that are obese, we have to sort of understand obesity and, and what they have. And so um, while Asians have a higher incidence of metabolic syndrome um, and metabolic diseases at lower BMI, which higher um, risk of complications after a ventral hernia repair, not all fat distribution is, is the same. And so you find some people that carry a lot of their uh, adiposity inside the abdominal cavity, whereas females actually tend to carry this outside the abdominal cavity. And so how do you care for these patients? How do you counsel them preoperatively? And when is an appropriate time to recommend surgery versus bariatric surgery? Um, and the timing of both of those. So um, looking at the study that looked at modifying risks in ventral hernia patients with uh, prehabilitation, they looked at 118 patients with a BMI of 30 to 40 undergoing electroventral ventral hernia repair. Um, the prehab group actually lost 7% weight loss or did not gain any weight at six months. And they were more likely to be hernia-free and complication-free at follow-up. So investment in prehab is certainly beneficial. Um, there was a trend to lower wound complications if you had prehabilitation, but the problem is, is there was a higher dropout, a need for emergent repair in those prehabilitation patients. And so what, how do you counsel these patients? Sometimes telling patients to lose weight just doesn't work. There's a lot of stigma about bariatric surgery. They've tried a lot of things, or their hernias are so large they feel like they cannot actually achieve that goal. And maybe BMI is not the best criteria for selection for these patients. Um, referral to uh, dedicated metabolics, uh, place is the best, and there's a lot more interventions that were originally available to our patients. So there are medications that are very effective for weight loss, and aluminal interventions decrease some of the concern. Bariatric surgery still has excellent results. Um, and maybe concomitant surgeries, including hernia and maybe a sleeve, are, are beneficial in selected patients. And so what do we do about it? First off, you have to figure out if the patient has a symptomatic hernia. Can it wait? If the answer is no, you probably need to proceed with repair. And there's actually some data that's coming out that says MIS repairs actually have a pretty low incidence of wound complications. Most of them are seromas, and most of them don't actually require intervention. So certainly, if it uh, can't wait, offer them a repair, and maybe MIS is best. What if they can wait? So every patient that is a candidate for a bariatric surgery procedure should be referred to a bariatric surgery um, surgeon. Um, and if they don't meet the criteria, then maybe you need to proceed with a repair and offer them an M MIS intervention. If they are a candidate, then yeah, you should proceed with the bariatric surgery um, and then can counsel them after some weight loss about the hernia repair. Um, if they're not a candidate, then you can try medical weight loss and then address the hernia down the road. And so my take-home points are obesity certainly is a potential modifier risk, fa risk factor for morbidity and recurrence. Um, in an elective sitting, uh, situation, all patients that are candidates for bariatric surgery should be referred to the appropriate uh, institution. 
Decision making should be individualized. So if you have a larger patient that has a very symptomatic hernia and MIS repair is an option, that's probably something that can be done safely with minimal morbidity. Um, certainly MIS approaches in these patients have a lower risk of wound morbidity um, with reasonable recurrence rates. Um, and the robot actually allows us to offer different procedures more um, that replicate an open approach to a wider variety of patients and will hopefully increase the care for patients that require hernia surgery that are obese. And again, the treatment doesn't end after hernia repair. So even after you have fixed the hernia, the goal is to always kind of improve their overall quality of life, um, try to help them achieve the weight loss that they wanted to, um, and make sure that they were uh, followed up by the appropriate uh, nutrition and other uh, metabolic options to help them um, have the best possible outcome after hernia repair. Thank you. Thank you again for the organizers. Um, I didn't, let's see, they pulled up. Well, while it's pulling up, um, who currently uses a robot or has access to a robot? Wow, one. Who is in the process of getting a robot? A few more. Okay. Well, um, I did not pick this title, so don't leave this room thinking that a uh, robot is going to be the cure for everything, and that's why I put it in quotations. Uh, my disclosures. So I am a minimally invasive general surgeon, um, but I focus in bariatrics, foregut, complex ab wall, and I do do acute care. And uh, I have been using the Da Vinci system since that's the only one FDA approved in the U.S., um, since 2012. So I've transitioned from, actually I should go from the standard, the second generation to the current fourth generation systems. Now, why did I start using the robot? I actually was exposed as a resident, actually even as a medical student when my own father had robotic surgery for his prostate. So I've been exposed quite a bit and I saw, saw the light for that. And then uh, really adapted it during uh, my training as a first assistant, um, I realized that one, it was sitting in the corner, it wasn't being utilized, and then when I wasn't attending, I could never get consistent help. They would send the medical student to my cases, so, or the intern who has never seen any of the uh, complex cases, and then uh, it was really hard to um, self-direct myself. But again, I was using it I actually think, in retrospect, the incorrect way. I was only using it for the most complex cases, highest BMIs, highest the redo operations, large inguinal scrotal hernias. And it was only until the residents and the medical students really saw interest. It's like, this is, this is the technology that's going to take us to the next level. So laparoscopy does have some limits. So even though I still do perform laparoscopic surgeries, um, I realized that I wasn't really offering it to everyone. Um, and some of these mantras still exist because the data is still proven, uh, at least on his obese patients, anyone with a BMI over 35, very high recurrence rates. I would avoid doing big rectal rectus operations and transverses abdominis releases. And I still hold to that um, uh, number pretty, pretty tightly unless there's circumstantial stances, but I would do IPOMs or hybrid approaches. Type four parasophageals, I would attack them, but I would have my thoracic colleagues on standby just in case we, would, we couldn't reach high enough or needed their support uh, interthoracically. Inguinals, BMI over 40, uh, I was a TEP uh, laparoscopic surgeon. I could never do taps. My arms were too short, uh, and my shoulders would hurt at the end. And the cases would take too long, um, or at least double what I would, could do in a uh, healthier patients. And bariatrics is where I really limited. Anyone over BMI 60, big abdominal walls, I would limit it to sleeves because doing a bypass and multi-quadrant surgery was quite tough. And then gallbladders, let's not even go there. So purely ergonomics, uh, that's where the robot has benefits. This is how... Um, I've seen cases done and pe people's uh, shoulders or arms are not level. The second picture on the, the right side picture doesn't look too bad, but look at the poor person holding this camera. Where's that arm coming from? Is it wrapped around the surgeon or is it uh, in front? 
And this is the ideal ergonomics that you really want to operate with on the left side and on the screen right is what most of us do. The monitors are not in the right position. The bed is never low enough. If you're using step stools, you're usually tripping over. And this is where it kind of translates to real world operating. Uh, the bottom right is um, a colleague that I just happened to walk into the room and I was like, what are you doing? This is what a robot room usually looks like. People are sitting. Um, I actually have st uh, chairs or stools for all my bedside uh, techs and my PA, my, my assistant, and monitors watching comfortably. And if they have a good day, I end up having a good day. So bariatrics, um, these are not my patients, but um, I realized that I don't actually take external views of my patients, probably for the best part, but imagine operating on patients like this. Um, how are you gonna actually do this in a millimeter invasive fashion laparoscopically? So what are the advantages of the robot? Well, one, it absorbs all the physical forces, the torque. Now there's some disadvantages with that, but the robot doesn't complain, doesn't feel any of the pressure. So the less physical pressure, less physical stress on the surgeon. My arms and shoulders don't hurt, better ergonomics. I'm not limited by range of motions, not limited by distance. I can move the arms in, move the arms out. There's different ways of teaching it, but the, it's, it's unlimited view. And in, in my hands, decreased chance for converting to open, which increases, which basically translates to less wound infections, less hernias, especially since we're talking about obese patients. The disadvantage is you really have to pay attention to the robot because since, you don't, since it doesn't translate forces back to you, you really don't know what forces are being translated to the patient. So there is more torque, could have more pain if the trocars are inserted incorrectly. Initially, everyone's worried about cases taking longer, which is fine, but eventually you get faster and we have data that shows after a certain learning curve, same for the trainees, you will actually be just as efficient, if not more efficient, because you're not dealing with um, um, ergonomics that actually hurt you. And there is a little separation anxiety in the beginning where you're not next to the patient, but eventually you get over it. So limit to robotic approach. I would say we do have some limits. I wouldn't go out and start doing complex uh, operations and break your own rules, but bariatrics is always going to be limited by institution. There's certain weight limits that you can do based on your beds and your CT scanners or the imaging that you have. And in the U.S., we are regulated for this as well. But I personally have a limit of BMI 70 um, just because of other reasons. Hiatal hernias, I'm more likely to do the recurrent uh, and offer them all the way to BMI 40. Which again, 35 to 40 is the gray area, but I will actually push it up to 40 depending on their symptoms. I will always refer them to bariatrics, which is myself, or actually the whole team, but uh, sometimes insurances won't cover it and there are limitations. Complex ab wall, this is where it's really changed. I will do uh, rectal rectus, reef stopas, uh, taps, at least up to BMI 40, which before I would just do an eye palm and try to get them to lose weight, especially if it's incarcerated or symptomatic. But now I am able to offer that with the robotic approach. And then inguinals, doesn't matter how big they are. I've done them the size of soccer balls, um, uh, footballs, and, and they do pretty well because I will do them tap, which I'm not able to do TEP. And with that, I think, Here's some bellies. I did show these are my own patients, and um, you, you can clearly tell the double wall can tolerate it. All right, that's it. Thanks. Perfect timing. I must say, um, uh, in Melbourne, we have College of Surgeons, and we have a um, uh, and there's an old book of aphorisms, of surgical aphorisms from the 1950s and 60s. Um, and in there, there's a phrase that says, there's a special place in hell for bariatric surgeons and the hernias they create. So doing it minimally invasive is definitely the way to go, <laughs> even though it doesn't always work. Um, so now we're just going to change it around a little bit. Um, Omar is actually online, so we might just get him to go next. So I think we have the technology to bring him on. If that's right. Or not? 
Oh, fantastic. All right. Omar, welcome. Thank you. Um, I, I am guilty, and Keith, it's me and Ramana who chose the the uh, title, so I, I take responsibility with Ramana for that. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, even virtually. I hope one day I get recognized uh, by the U.S. so that I can uh, travel as any other person, so I apologize for that. It's my dream to be uh, one day in, in India with uh, such a good group uh, of surgeons, truly. Um, let me just share my screen. So, um, hernia management and bariatric surgery. Um, I have no disclosures. The only disclosure I have is that most of the things I want to show is our, our laparoscopic surgery because uh, unlike Ankit, I do surgery on patients who are, have BMI above 78, who have big hernias. And uh, this is my, my disclosure. In fact, that's my preference in patients who have hernias. I use the robot for primary sleeves and bypasses unless they have hernias, in fact. Sorry. Um, so obesity, what we know is that obesity is associated with hernia repair complications. That's what we know. But there is a lot of things we don't know. What is the BMI threshold to operate on a patient who has hernia? What's the ideal one? We talk about 30, 35, 40. You know, there's always that kind of range rather than a specific BMI. We don't know truly what is the role of the uh, novel MIS abdominal wall reconstructions uh, repairs. And we don't know what's the effect of the surgeon skills and or follow up on that. What we also don't know is the hernia management during bariatric surgery. We have no idea about how to do that. What's the ideal way or the best way scientifically? We all do our own thing and think it works best. Also, we don't know when to operate after weight loss. Is it when the weight plateaus, weight loss plateaus? Is it when the um, um, patient loses a specific amount of weight um, and, and that's it, let's go for surgery? We don't know what the abdominal wall compliance after weight loss is like and, and truly should we wait as much to perform those hernia repairs if we do um, bariatric surgery ahead of time. The only paper we have, a real paper we have on this is really from the American Hernia Society and ASMBS uh, about hernias and bariatric surgery, but really they talked about the problems, but they weren't both with this paper able to link it to the solution. What should we do? We don't know. We have many weight loss options, dietary lifestyle, only significant paper I would say is the one by Rosen's group, which uh, they used all those uh, protein-based diets and minimal number of patients got some weight loss, uh, but that's it. We have newer medications, you know, we hear this every day, Ozempic, um, Wigovi, and, and it's kind of like um, interesting that I have a patient who I did a TAR on in the hospital that has acidosis just because she is one of these medications and it was stopped, although it stopped one week before. So they have their own complications as well, lead to about 22% with the highest number of uh, total body weight loss, but but that's it. And most of our patients come needing more than this 20% as well. And, and these medications are not truly available in the US except for some uh, certain insurances. And now they are on back order and you can only get them if you're diabetic. Other options are endoscopic. So for me, endoscopic, uh, I am lucky to have Barham Abudaya uh, in, in my uh, just one phone call away, because if we get such cases where you have an upper abdominal hernia, where you have stomach plastered into the abdominal wall, and, and you know, it's going to be a very difficult sleeve uh, even afterwards, then this is when, like, I would say the endoscopic options with ESG are, are reasonable. And then, uh, you know, they can do things now um, uh, in, in specific situations like these. And this leads to, um, according to the merit study, which I was part of, but led by Barham, uh, leads to about 13.6% total body weight loss at two years. Great. But what do we do with patients like this? This is a patient who already had a bypass, had a BMI of 77, dropped to BMI of 54, I believe, still has a defect, 12 centimeters, but still the BMI is 54. Uh, these are, again, good indications for endoscopy where a, an endoscopic approach uh, with doing a trans reduction of the gastric outlet uh, can drop the patient further. And this specific patient... At the end of the procedure, the gastrogen... And this, this specifically uh, patient lost about 13 uh, points of BMI. Uh, and I took her to the operating room. And you can see here, the defect is huge. 
But because of such weight loss, look at this. I mean, I'm able to, I ended up doing TAR just for, for um, uh, purposes of overlap rather than because I cannot close the defect per se. Uh, Tar paniculectomy, she did well afterwards. But again, this is not my cases. My cases today are talking about bariatrics. Of course, this is a typical case we see. This is a case of mine, upper abdominal hernia, and has everything in her in her hernia. Omentum, bowel, sorry for the speedy um, um, uh, video here, but even with the speedy video, look how much I'm taking out and how much is coming still into the abdomen. I cannot do a sleeve while all of the abdominal contents are really in the sub region, I have to reduce. This is a higher uh, kind of hernia. And most importantly, she had two episodes of bowel obstruction before the surgery. So I cannot just depend on the fact that she's not going to have bowel obstruction after the surgery, because if she does, she's going to blow the, the proximal staple line. So look at this. I mean, 13 centimeter defect. This was before I became an, uh, you know, um, um, this, is, this is the defect. So I ended up doing a sleeve. I opened the, the defect uh, above, placed a, a biologic mesh. This was my first laparoscopic tar, I believe, after I, I did this. So I brought her back about eight, eight months afterwards and did a laparoscopic tar on her. And uh, again, um, the biologic mesh, we, I knew it's going to dissolve, but it gave me a good bridge to get to the surgery. Now, another way I deal with these this is a patient who had 11 surgeries before me. The last surgery at Mayo Clinic, hernia repair, took about 10 hours. Um, has a parast uh, sorry, has a parastomal hernia for a transverse colostomy. Already had a sleeve. So now what? You know, um, uh, has a huge defect. Um, BMI 46 at that time. I took her to the operating room. Um, Lice the adhesions, finally made it to the hernia. And, and you know, again, most of her abdomen is within the hernia defect. So the patient already had a sleeve, so I planned a sadie on her. Uh, as this will give me another probably 30% total body weight loss from what we know. So after reduction of the bowels, lysis, continued lysis of adhesion, um, here in the pelvis, kind of freeing the bowel to be able to measure it. And then um, I did the SADI afterwards. And then I had to deal with the hernia. So this is, uh, I believe I've utilized this technique now in about 11 patients. The last patient was today, uh, BMI 78, who had a big defect that I utilized the same technique where I bring the momentum up and put it up in the defect again to prevent the bowels from going into the, so I suture it to the hernia sac, to the edges, and I bring up the momentum and shove it back again into the hernia sac. Now it's interesting because one of the patients out of the 11 came back to the ER and they, the, the, um, um, CT scan read that there is an incarcerated momentum. Well, that's the purpose. We want an incarcerated momentum within the hernia defect. Again, this was published in surgical laparoscopy, endoscopy, percutaneous techniques, but what I call the omental plug, and this saves me in these cases. Uh, of course, they would say, why don't you do just a mesh? Um, we do this. I, I've, I've seen this. There is a good series from India, in fact, of using a, a mesh in uh, cases, especially in sleeve gastrectomy. This is a patient who had 54 abdominal surgeries before she presented to me, 54. Uh, uh, I um, She has a 22 centimeter hernia and they wanted me to do a weight loss surgery. Uh, she has a history of um, um, substance abuse. So I said, you know what, I have to stop smoking. You have to stop the uh, cocaine and then I have to test you for six months. And I knew this is not gonna happen. So this was my escape while well, she did it. She changed her life. And she presented back, and now I'm obliged to do this. This was my initial trocar placement. So that is why I say uh, I, I placed my first trocar, and then um, I am seeing this. Wow. So again, I mean, th this is not the, the, the best place to place a mesh. Mesh can get infected. Um, so there must be alternatives. In this case, I went back to the right upper quadrant, um, kind of placed three trocars literally within about five centimeters, look at my scissors. I can't even reach the, the the abdominal wall because of how small the area is I'm working in. Finally, kind of clear some 
hernia sac there where I can see now some good hernia sac was able to put another trocar then um, kept dissecting until I, I made it to the area where I felt I went into the colon um, closed the colotomy now it was more than one attempt to get into that abdomen that's for sure so I was worried about having a posterior hole in the colon or another hole that I cannot see because of the scar tissue so here I'm closing the colotomy and then I proceeded afterwards with doing the a sleeve gastrectomy after lysing the adhesions in the upper abdomen. This was the left liver lobe. Finally, sleeve looks good. I did an on-table colonoscopy. I called my partners and I said, you know what, the patient has been on liquid diet for two weeks. Why don't we do just a, the on-table colonoscopy? Tested the colon. There was no bubbling. And, and then she finally got the hernia repair, not by me, by one of my colleagues um, about three weeks ago. So this is my algorithm. Again, when there is a sleeve gastrectomy, if it's in the lower belly, the hernia defect, plugged with fat or bowel, no obstruction, leave alone. If it's in the upper abdomen and there is an open defect, if it's a small, I close primarily. If it's large, more than 10 centimeters, leave it alone. This is not going to incarcerate. Same if I go to the other side on the bypass. Most of the time, bypass procedures, say DDS or, or uh, bypass, you have to reduce the bowel. Most of the time, I'm saying. So you're going to end up with open defect. If it's small, two, three centimeters, closes without tension, close primarily. Wide, leave alone. But those medium defects, this is when if you close primarily, I've seen this enough, it will come back within hours. Within hours, you'll see the patient coming back, the hernia coming back. And you're back in the operating room with an obstruction. And this can blow up the proximal staple lines. Mesh, I'm not a fan of using the mesh in these cases. But this is where the mental patch or plug really comes into, into uh, play. Thank you for watching. And again, uh, great to be uh, watching your lectures even from US at, at 1 a.m. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, any questions for Omar before we lose him or have we lost him? Nope, I think he's gone, so we should probably move on. Um, Charlotte, do you want to introduce? Him? Oh, he said he do, do you want to ask questions? Oh, we, oh, he's back. Okay, any questions for Omar? Uh, well, I have one, which is so, Omar, how long do you think you should wait from the bariatric surgery to hernia surgery? Do you do you have a period or an amount of weight they, they want to lose? Uh, thank you. Great question. And, and really, it's individualized. So a patient who has a BMI of 78, like the one I did today, and loses, Sadie would give her 38% total body weight loss. So we're still BMI above 40. She will never make it below 40. So if you wait even till ever, this is your opportunity. Either you're going to help the patient now or you won't. Those patients have so much laxity. The compliance is amazing. So yes, wound morbidity is something we think about. But that's the, the window. Either you do it now or you never do it. So ideally, in a patient 45, 46 BMI, you do a sleeve or a bypass. I wait till the weight loss curve plateaus, usually around six, eight months. Then it starts slowing down. That's the right time before they start kind of gaining those 10, 20 pounds after one year. Then in a patient who has a very high BMI, there is that window. Now I do. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, and again to the organising committee for inviting me to join you here at this amazing meeting here in Delhi. And so I'm going to very briefly review how we manage the abdomen after massive weight loss. And I think it would be fair to say this is anything but minimally invasive, because of course we're all faced with the reality of an enlarging population. And the fact is that once they've undergone bariatric procedures, they go from one form of uh, morbidity and abnormality into a second form. And I refer to this as a surgical aftershock because having gone from one body habitus where they're large and isolated uh, and restricted, deflation of this tissue result, uh, presents with gross horizontal and vertical tissue access, which will result in intertrigo, immobility, and most patients following bariatric procedures will experience some functional or psychological upset. So the challenge is how you deal with the patient's expectation and, of course, how you actually deal with their surgical requirements. And in between this, you've got to recognize that if they've undergone bariatric surgery, they're likely to be metabolically compromised because, by definition, they are malnutritioned. 
And careful thought, therefore, needs to be given to the timing of surgery uh, and how you actually conduct it and what you actually do, because the ultimate aim is to achieve something safe. So the surgical challenge can be absolutely significant, requiring specialist equipment, specialist anesthetic support, etc. So the patient wants us to remove as much skin as possible and provide them with uh, a natural shape and in as few stages as possible. But the reality is you can't and you need to carefully counsel your patient and plan their procedures really carefully. Peroperatively, we heard from Vickle's last talk about optimization in terms of diet, but also you need to be thinking about uh, vitamin support uh, uh, and, of course, continuing their abilities to mobilize. Expect a high complication rate in this group post-surgery, particularly in terms of minor soft tissue issues which will require intensive nursing support. And remember that those patients are going to need repeat procedures. This point of nutrition is absolutely essential. I would refer this patient to you from Dennis Hurwitz in Pittsburgh. This is one of a number of papers that have come out in PRS looking at the realities of the post-bariatric patient. And almost all of these patients suffer measurable macro and micronutrient deficiencies. And I put all of my patients on a cocktail prior to surgery consisting of vitamin C, zinc, uh, an iron tablet, and then getting them to increase their protein intake, just as we saw in Vickle's last talk, uh, to about uh, 100 to 125 grams per day. When we're thinking about the abdomen, the key thing that we're looking at is the key procedure, which is a circumferential body lift, which is, as its name implies, a circular reduction of the abdomen, the lower back, and a posterior lateral thigh lift. And this is the keystone of massive weight loss procedures. Preoperatively, when you see patients, they're not always going to present with the same habitus. The patient that you see on your left-hand side, you're going to be looking to achieve a much more aesthetic result than you might do with this lady on the right, or certainly with this patient on the right here who was just over a meter 50 tall and had lost 80 kilos. In planning a body lift, we're having to create a scar that sits low and will actually take up the excess 360 degrees. You see I've got three measurements in the mid-axillary line there. The upper one marks the pelvic brim. The one just below, five centimeters below, is where we're actually going to have the upper level of the scar. We don't want it on the pelvic brim so that clothes and jeans, et cetera, don't rub against it. And the lower mark is where we've managed to pinch it with undue, without undue tension. Now the lower mark has continued to just above the natal cleft, about four centimeters above, and the upper one, again, via a pinch technique to be able to establish with the patient standing optimum tension-free closure. And this is just some simple examples of patients after stage surgery. This patient's undergone a circumferential lift as well as a medial thigh lift and some modest outer thigh lipoplasty. When you're dealing with patients of this size, the emphasis is on staging. And the image that you see on the left uh, is, of course, the patient from a front view and a posterior view on the right, showing you such significant deflation over the scapulae. This shows you the patient's paniculus. This has actually turned out to be quite modest. This was only 11 kilos. Uh, I've had an 18 kilo uh, panis before, and that's actually quite small compared to some of my colleagues. So, via stage procedures, we can achieve very pleasing results, but I'll draw your attention to two other interesting results. Uh, and techniques. This is truncoplasty, described by Moya, but published by my friend and colleague Naguib El Matadi in Essex in the UK, which, convert, which basically combines fleur de lis excisions without any uh, subcutaneous undermining. And it's really a very simple but elegant method. So the patient is placed supine. You use tailor tacking to be able to bring the skin together. This indicates when you've taken the staples out, the extent of that skin excess. It's very dramatic. You see the size of the defect. It can then be closed, which then allows you to remove the excess in the lower part of the abdomen and the flank and in the upper part of the abdomen. So removing skin without actually undermining the tissues. And this can result in a very pleasing result in patients that you would not normally consider uh, undermining in terms of uh, a circumferential body lift. Other techniques uh, publicized here by uh, Vera Vegas in, in uh, Colombia. Tulio, which was basically a wide pan paniculectomy with liposuction and then recreating the umbilicus. Important to emphasize, all these patients benefit from negative wound pressure therapy to close and splint their wound postoperatively. And of course, complications, as I mentioned in this patient group, with appropriate patient selection are common 
particularly in the abdominal plasty, up to 40% of patients, but they tend to be modest in terms of minor soft tissue dehiscence, which may require dressings at most, very rarely with appropriate nutritional support will they present with uh, wider dehiscence. It's extremely rare, so preparation is key. Um, in terms of BMI and smoking, I certainly would not operate on any patient who's been smoking within eight weeks of surgery. Uh, and I'll go on to discuss BMI. Simply put, when you're dealing with patients of this size, the last thing you want to do is undertake an abdominoplasty. Undermining the abdominal flap is an absolute no-no because the fat is very thick, it's very vulnerable to uh, devascularization, and you'll end up with an absolute disaster of an open wound that will take months to heal. So in these patients, if they're large, but they're presenting with a troublesome panis like this, the only option is a paniculectomy. And this is not a procedure without its risks. You can imagine that you're dealing with thick and again, very vulnerable fat, but these patients really are suffering. This, this tissue panis is heavy, it's lymphedematous, and so with these patients with, a, panis, uh, with a, a BMI over 35, where their weight loss is stalled, either send them back to the bariatric surgeon or consider some form of paniculectomy. And this will involve um, absolutely no undermining of the overlying skin. You stand the patient up, you place the hand up behind the panis, mark a perpendicular to the anterior skin, uh, and perform a, a simple excision. Um, this still creates a very significant dead space, and so it's really important to drain those patients thoroughly and for a prolonged period of time, and again, the use of negative wound pressure. As you can see, following our preceding two talks, of course, this bariatric surgery has become endemic, uh, and there's a sustained key, uh, a sustained increase in demand. It is difficult to achieve a lasting result with these patients because their skin has lost its elasticity, it tends to shrink, it tends to stretch rather, it doesn't contract in any meaningful way, uh, and you need to be aware you're going to need to have significant nursing support in the management of these patients. Just one little comment that I would just make. In Vickle's last talk, you mentioned about the use of semaglutide. I, I have to tell you, in the UK, uh, it's now become almost endemic, and increasingly I'm seeing patients who are not morbidly obese, who are coming in having been prescribed this to optimize weight loss. Anyway, thank you very much. Thank you, uh, thank you, Ramana. Great, great meeting. Uh, pleasure to be here. So I'm almost like an outlier, but I'll try and pitch in. Uh, so uh, when I was asked to do a talk on obesity and uh, hernia, I thought I'd just speak on something that we see, which is not would not have been probably spoken very, very commonly at this meeting out over here. So I spoke about the internal hernia, the the hidden elephant in the room, which nobody speaks about in obesity. So I'll just play a, a few videos for you to see. This is one of the most commonest internal hernias. Patients done well, lost weight, suddenly comes with acute abdominal pain, and voila. What you see is the entire bowel has herniated through the Peterson's defect, just below the transverse colon. Uh, so there is always a debate. Do you close all the defects in Ruamai gastric bypass? Do you just close the mesenteric? Do you close the Peterson's or pseudo-Peterson's, whatever you want to call it? But the fact of the matter remains is that I have a, a practice which does primarily rheumatic gastric bypass. And there was a time when I would not close this defect thinking it's large enough, so bubble will come in and go out at the most. Nothing worse can happen. And then I realized that there were catastrophic uh, problems sometimes. And if you didn't go into time, uh, there could be a chance where you could lose the entire small bubble. I do know I spoke to some colleagues of mine who've had patients now uh, actually lined up for small bowel transplants because of the complete herniation. And uh, so uh, the idea is close both your defects, look at the mesenteric defect, which we had closed previously. Whenever you get patients with abdominal pain, do not ignore them, irrespective of what your CT findings are. A diagnostic laparoscopy is not going to hurt you. The next is any abdominal pain uh, with a patient uh, with uh, Pediatric surgery, please do not ignore it, because this is what you can get sometimes. Uh, the entire jejun or jejunostomy had got kinked across the elementary limb and caused an internal herniation from there. So funnier things can happen with uh, the moment we touch. The problem with laparoscopic surgery is that invariably there's not much uh, of adhesions, as you can see. These are all patients who've been operated 
a uh, couple of years back at least, and there are hardly any adhesions uh, inside. And that's what you see after the surgery. You look to the bowel, bowel displaces, and the patient goes home the same day. Uh, these are the most dreaded of all complications. Patient presented with banded bypass, so uh, uh, the video is not playing. Video is not playing. Yeah, you can play any, you can play any of these three. Okay, so this is, uh, this is what we saw as uh, when we went in, patient had presented with acute abdominal pain. This was a, a different type of band, there are different bands that I've used. Uh, by the time, unfortunately, the patient presented to us after being admitted to another hospital elsewhere, patient had presented with uh, this kind of gangrenous picture. What's happening? <clears throat> that, that was the CT uh, of this patient, which was done previously. As you can see, the, the ring is there. You can see free fluid. So this had already perforated by the time the patient presented to us. And that was the picture that I got to see in. So the first thing I went and did was to look at this ring. This, in this case, it was the Foby ring. We divided the Foby ring. What happens is there's a herniation of the entire elementary limb between the pouch and uh, the ring. You go mobilize, try and look at what is the gangrenous part so that you have to resect it. Unfortunately, most of the times there's a complete gangrene of the entire elementary limb. And with the perforation, that leaves us. You look at the rest of the bowel, inspect it. That's the ileocecal junction, that's the elementary limb. So now you go, I'm going to reverse the entire procedure. I've divided it, removed the entire gangrenous limb in this case, and transecting the pouch just above the gastrojejunostomy, then make an entrotomy and do a gastrogastrostomy. So I'm completely reversing it, doing the jejunojejunostomy. So now this patient has got normal anatomy. He's just lost the elementary limb. Uh, this, this, unfortunately, was a patient that presented us soon after uh, a C-section. No, next, next video. Yeah. Now, this is a patient who came to us early, luckily, and we could actually save her. So this was, again, a phobia ring. We divided this, and as you can see, that the bowel was still healthy. We, we put uh, warm saline, then the color of the bowel changed. So these can be quite catastrophic complications. So if you don't go in at the right period of time, you can land up with a lot of trouble. Uh, that's the ischemic uh, bowel. As you can see, the entire limb right up to the JJ invariably gets uh, transfixed because of the banded uh, uh, bypass. That's it. Uh, the last video, the last video. A core video helps me. This, I think you've already played. This you've already played. So there are different types of rings and, and stuff like that that can happen. This is just a compilation of all the internal hernias, besides the port hernias. I didn't want to carry the port hernias. Uh, like I asked uh, Omar in my first question before, that what would happen if a patient comes with an obstructed hernia and patient's obese? What we do do is uh, we reduce the hernia uh, and we are, we are forced into operating this patient because the patient's obstructed. Uh, if it's not gangrenous, we would do a concomitant sleeve uh, to either uh, an IPOM, though we know that the IPOM plus, we would repair the hernia, uh, suture the defect, and close it with an IPOM uh, mesh. At the same time, the advantage is with the sleeve, you're going to drop the BMI from 55 to at least around the 35, 40. So when the patient comes with a recurrence, wherein you need to do an ETEP, a uh, reef stopa, or a TAR and, and additionally, the BMI is much lower, and you can do a much better job at that point in time. Thank you.
Thank you, Dr. Mukti. We'll take questions together. So. Yeah. Thank you. Right. Any questions? Right. Oh, well, I have a question. So, um, uh, Praveen, uh, to Ankit. Praveen, uh, in oh. your series, you have clubbed uh, IPOM with all these bariatric procedures, or you have tried supply repair as well? Yeah, so the series that we have published, and after that also we have done uh, quite a number of sublay repairs also, because I think we were, uh, I was actually supposed to go on a discussion on this before I actually take up questions. Okay. So I'll probably uh, answer your question and then go on the discussion front. Okay, fine. Uh, but then, but then uh, normally in from, from my perspective, we try to do bariatric along with what we would have done for the hernium. I think the problem starts is we try to do different things because we want to do a bariatric surgery or because the patient is obese. Hello. Let's say, for example, because this is primarily being a hernia conference, when we primarily, we first see the hernia, let us assume the patient wasn't obese. If you have a, let's assume the patient was obese. I mean, not, uh, not obese. Patient might come with the loss, of, uh, the loss of domain. Patient might have a complex hernia. Patient can have multiple different surgeries. We would have a plan of approach. So that is what we've been discussing since yesterday. But then when we are planning, now because the patient is obese, we want to do a bariatric surgery. Now we are completely changing the approach because we want to come in a bariatric, because we have the fear of doing a bariatric and a mesh repair together. Because that is the primary point to start, uh, start with. Can I do a clean contaminated procedure, so-called clean contaminated procedure, along with the mesh repairs? That is why we are doing different techniques. I think I had a discussion with Omar, he places biological meshes, or he does an omental plug. This we wouldn't have otherwise done if the patient was non-obese. So this is what we try to address. If the patient comes to us with a hernia, we always, always make sure if the patient is obese, we have a bariatric consultation similar to a tumor board. The hernia team and our bariatric team, we sit together, decide what will be right for that particular patient because you shouldn't be compromising either things. Just because we're a hernia surgeon, we shouldn't be aligning the needle towards the hernia side because that's that that's what we are good at. Or if we are bariatric surgeons, we try, tend to do the bar bar bariatric more often and tend to push the hernia. But then we all agree obesity is one of the most important precipitating factors for a primary or recurrent hernia, even bigger than your chronic cough, chronic difficulty in mixturation and chronic constipation, where we always say address the precipitating factor before you do the hernia. But same way in obesity as such, some, sometimes we aren't addressing. We, we, we try to push it on. But then our series, whatever be the hernia, even if it's a large hernia where you require a rife stopper repair, with an ETEP approach, we would combine it along with a bariatric surgery, sometimes even with the Rwanda gastric bypass. So that is my series. Okay, thank you. And, and do you see much infection? When no, that, see, that's always again, concern. so that is, that is again the question we always talk about in infection as such. In our, in our last series, which we published in the SORT, because we've been publishing our series over time. But then the question everyone still has is, is it safe enough to put? What will be the incidence of mesh infection? Mm. So we try to analyze why is, isn't that we're getting a mesh infections. So we went through all the data with regard to peritoneal filtration mechanism. About 15% of Rwanda gastric bypass patients, if we take the bacterial culture from the peritoneal fluid, you'll have 15% positive culture. But that doesn't mean that will reflect into mesh infection. Because whenever there is bacteria in the peritoneal cavity, the neutrophils and the macrophages comes to the rescue of the bacterium and the peritoneum is sterile in less than 24 hours. And more than that, the diaphragmatic pores uh, operate as a filtration barrier to remove these bacteria. If you actually go back on regular mesh infection that you have had, forget these combinations. The mesh infections have always been gram-positive series, which simply says the infection is coming from inadequate sterilization of the abdomen. Or in, in developing countries or underdeveloped countries, atypical mycobacteria, sure. which talks about inf um, the instrumentation sterilization. It is never, almost never from enterogenous bacteria. So infection means we need to understand what we are addressing. So if this is handled properly, the sterilization mechanisms, where we are doing is handled properly, mesh infection from the bowel would not be an issue. Even the bacteria in the peritoneal cavity will be, filtration, will be filtered by the peritoneal mechanism. This is from the learnings from continuous ambulatory peritoneal dialysis mechanisms, peritoneal immune mechanism, which we have tried to address in this paper. So because I think now we have enough data combining mesh repairs with cholecystectomies. I'm not talking about acute cholese or purulent. Combining mesh repairs along with uh, his Hysterectomies, combining TEPs along with TURPs for uh, for BPHSS. So I think this age-old mechanism. I thought that putting a mesh, a composite mesh, in a clean contaminated environment is bad. Is something we need to get away. 
we need to move on from the thought we have enough data and this is what we have tried to look into i think i'll urge uh, uh, all of you to get into the understanding of peritoneal mechanism we can safely put in the mesh the other factors is what we have to address and not the bubble bacteria as such because the peritoneum can take care of that i don't know if you can hear me but yes I, yes dr omar we can thank you so much i mean great always you, you bring something new to the table and thank you for that but you gave some you know first bile doesn't have bacteria except if you have an infection different than what we see in the bowel most of the upper intestinal infections if you have a jj leak the only thing that would show on the skin is a gram positive which is a strep series so having a gram positive doesn't mean there is a lack of sterilization it's not e coli that infects the abdomen as if you have a jj leak it's always a strep series so it is a gram positive as well that's that's number two you you mentioned hysterectomy the the uterus is most of the time sterile having turp that's sterile urine is sterile the, the fact that we're dealing with bowel i may not disagree with you i did bowel resection yesterday uh, during my my um my talk that is not the point but you're putting the mesh in a different plane now you tell me you want to do reef stopper at the same time of bariatric surgery my argument would be that you are doing the perfect surgery in an imperfect setting that would be my argument but to say that on ipon and the 15% chance is fine i don't i mean again i'm respect i respect your series but i think you, you mentioned also we have enough data we have your series which i respect very much i'm not against uh, again i haven't tried it so i cannot argue against what you have published but at the same time we don't have enough data unfortunately no i i i in a litigious country like the us if i'm reviewing the case and the patient gets an infection and dies because of a mesh infection or a, because of a abdominal wall say catastrophe or neck fash or anything a patient who has a bmi of 60 and got a mesh that got infected i would say this is from from what i know i would say that this was probably a mistake with what mesh was used and it was in what setting in a sleeve we can argue is it a clean contaminated there is no much you know but when a bypass or a open bowel uh, the the argument is different again I, i i'm i respect your series but i don't think the message should be that that's fine we can use it and see the outcomes you are doing it the right way with publications and we'll wait probably for more data to say everybody can do it the same I I completely agree with you Omar I I don't want to make it a debate we just want to be more of a discussional <laughs> front yeah I I said oh sure okay cheers cheers uh, I know as much as I agree we don't have enough data to support or prospectively to ad- advocate it I also would say we don't have enough data to say you shouldn't be doing it also except for the age old belief that we shouldn't be putting it because we have moved on we have enough data from the other other uh, signs that we have and again here we are operating in a completely controlled environment it is not like an obstructed hernia with its translocation of bacteria where once you open the contents of the bubble are pouring into the peritoneal cavity we have a completely controlled environment where we just opening the bubble it's not that the contents of the bubble are pouring into the abdominal cavity and they are closed under con- controlled environment so it is that perspective that even this little bit of bacteria that could be there the peritoneal mechanism is strong enough to address i would not be doing it on somebody where i open the bubble for a jejunal jejunostomy you have a lot of content that's poured over the peritoneal cavity i would just wash it and keep it a mesh i wouldn't but then that that because in a bariatric it's an elective setting it's purely controlled environment this is possible i wouldn't be doing it on a complicated patient in a septic patient again that is not the advocacy i would try to do obviously I think we have Thank you. one more question Perfect. and then we're done with the session. I just have a quick comment. We're forgetting one other thing, mesh properties. Omar and I, we talk about this, but in all these settings, you have to know what mesh you're putting in because wrong mesh is what doesn't matter what bacteria is in there, the wrong mesh at the wrong time will get infected. So we're forgetting you have to know your meshes and you have to know the mesh properties for all these concomitant operations. So one little thing we're forgetting to talk about. absolutely i agree totally. i think we have come to the end of the session and over thank you guys um thank you always going. thank you cheers thank come. you bye i think it's time for lunch yeah i think they have another session <laughs>